All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Lunch Break for anyone who's joined us before. And thanks for being here for those here for the first time. I'm Carrie. And today we're talking with biomedical engineer Biju Parakadin and creative entrepreneur and artist Jay Webb. Together, the two have written Legends of Sumeria, a science fiction graphic novel about genetics, genomes, and survival. An excerpt of their novel was featured at one of our exhi exhibitions, Infinite Potentials. Um, Biju oversees a laboratory that specializes in cell and genetic engineering, is professor of biomedical engineering at Rutgers, and co-founder of Sentian Biotechnologies. Jay Webb is a writer, creative director, and film producer. He's the creator of two successful film and media companies, Evolving Productions and Indie Street Media, and he recently completed his first science art mural, Sine Waves. So we will be spending some time at the end of um, this talk answering some questions from the audience. So you can send those in anytime throughout this using the Q&A function. Um, Jay and Biju, thanks for being here and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, thank you. Hi, how is everybody doing today? Uh, Biju and I are, first wanna thank Sire Initiative for um, having us on just to talk about you know, the intersections between science and art and to tell you a little bit about our uh, hard science graphic novel, which um, is becoming more and more uh, poignant in the moment of what we're all going through right now, trying to make order out of all of this chaos that we are seeing. Um, so we're gonna uh, just first talk about the, uh, about the piece. This is the cover of the book and it was uh, the piece of digital art that I created for the cover of Legend of Sumeria and the SciArt Initiative. I uh, was grateful, um, I mean, gratefully enough, able to include it in their Infinite Potentials uh, exhibit, uh, exhibit. And this piece, just as briefly as possible, it's called Twisted Scales. And I think it um, is re representative of Bijou and my relationship because you know, one of the main things that got our brains sort of melding is our interest in the different scales of existence and how they can influence each other uh, or how they can actually, um, or how we can learn from one scale to make discoveries on other scales. For instance, if we know something about how humans act or how human biology behaves, maybe we can apply that to certain discoveries or certain research in planetary um, behaviors or on the same level and in, in the planets if there are things that we're figuring out um, you know astrophysically we can p potentially use some of that information to study cells and how cells act and uh, you know it's that type of uh, conversation that lead led us down rabbit hole after rabbit hole that kind of turned into the book that is Legend of Sumeria so um, this this piece is is sort of talking about those scales, but also just, uh, you know, the struggle of mankind to be able to try to grasp it all when, of course, um, you know, at least how human beings are currently composed, we can't, we can't uh, mentally and physically actually understand everything in this universe, which is a struggle sometimes. So um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so that the symbol, the symbol that you see in there, uh, and this is also kind of a good, good continuation of the struggle of, of human beings to want to know and want to be able to explain everything that they see. Um, this, this symbol was an intergalactic event, a uh, star explosion that our ancestors saw from, um, you know, from right around the time when we were having the brain capacity to be able to, to uh, transcribe images. So they see this and it becomes the first symbol that our ancestors are transcribing. And from that one uh, star explosion and this one symbol became the first conflict because some people thought it was evil, some people thought it was you know, a godsend and it was good, so there was the first conflict um, which the winners of that conflict created the first civilization and we were off to the races. Uh, and our book begins with a, a symbologist who is trying to find out the meaning of this symbol and trying to find out why this symbol has been attached to a bioterrorist group who, is, uh, who has launched a, um, you know, a 
a pandemic of sorts into society, uh, but it, it was way more of a, a planned violent attack, uh, but it, was, it, it caused a bunch of genetic manipulations and deaths that kind of shoots our, our story off. Um, we can go on to the next one. Uh, so, so I'm going to let Bijou talk about this uh, a bit, but, but really, uh, we, the more we kind of worked together and just came up with crazy ideas and Bijou tried his best to, to, to make <laughs> science, uh, like to actually make the science fit with what we were um, just coming up with, uh, we, we realized that the process of scientists and creatives really is something that uh, should somehow happen more than it does. Uh, and it, we think it could lead to a lot of uh, humongous discoveries. Um, and in our book, it, it led to uh, future discoveries that we you know, predicted were going to happen. Obviously, a lot of them were a little bit fantastical, but we tried to keep the science uh, really legit behind it, or at least Bijou did. And, um, you know, you'll see that in the book, a lot of the things are already somewhat starting to come to fruition, or at least there are now some glimpses of things that we might want to keep our eye on because it's a, it's a little bit of a tale of caution, uh, Legend of Sumeria is, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it was a fantastic process working with, uh, a, you know, an artist, a creative like, like Jay Webb. Uh, he, really, uh, <laughs> he, he really pushed uh, the, the boundaries of, uh, uh, you know, what a, what a scientist uh, um, imagines uh, that could be. So oftentimes uh, people who uh, get educated in, in any respect, sometimes their, their thinking is limited just uh, because of the nature of what they've learned. Uh, but creatives don't really have those bounds. And. Uh, I think there were a lot of moments in Sumeria where uh, we were trying to have this really uh, dramatic worldview that has changed because of the introduction of a really uh, powerful gene therapy, uh, this bioterror uh, threat that Jay had already mentioned, uh, and a push for um, you know a vaccine in, in parallel with uh, potentially people finding a new home in space. So all of this was was taking place and. Uh, you know, I think what really drove that worldview of being, uh, you know, very enriched and very um, fantastical was Jay just asking questions about what could be without um, uh, really considering any sort of technical basis for it. And that, uh, you know, I think led me to, instead of just negating everything that uh, <laughs> was, um, uh, you know, very, uh, you know, artistic in nature, I tried to adopt uh, as much as possible, um, you know, these ideas and see if there was a scientific underpinning that, that could lead us there. And so I think in, in all of these different threads uh, that involve technology, whether they be gene therapy um, or uh, this, uh, this sort of genetic network um, uh, that, that really dominates society, uh, or even uh, some of the aerospace um, engineering and, and um, adventures that take place by one of the characters, in all cases, I think we really did our homework and tried to establish uh, some fundamental science that uh, could get us there with a lot of new innovations on top. So it was, I think it was a really great, um, you know, interaction back and forth and I encourage it, um, you know, for, for uh, future um, makers of, of, of science and, and art uh, creations. So uh, I'll, I'll proceed to elaborate on a few of the characters uh, in this book. This book um, has uh, a number of characters, each with uh, really deep story threads, and we see them weave in and out uh, throughout this, this novel. Uh, and so the first uh, character is, is Dr. Bruce Abbott. Uh, he discovers uh, this gene therapy, uh, re referred to as Tigris, which really changes the face of uh, medicine in its current day. Uh, so where the, the society at one point was plagued with things like HIV or tuberculosis or these really, um, uh, you know, uh, injurious uh, infectious disease, this gene therapy eliminates that. So it's almost a cure-all in a sense. Um, and it has uh, really unforeseen impacts on society. And I think as a scientist, uh, I know that, you know, we're often, uh, sometimes pretty narrow in, in view, where we're just trying to make this next breakthrough, uh, really try to bring something to um, the populace that can help um, people's health. But oftentimes you don't really see the entire forest and uh, we, we sort of unravel a story where this scientist along with others uh, that developed this groundbreaking um, 
medicine start to see that it actually changes society in unpredictable ways and, and we start to uh, you know follow this character and and uh, this changing uh, world and uh, you know hopefully uh, you know drive the reader to ask themselves a lot of bioethical and moral questions that we asked ourselves um, as we uh, put this story together yeah so I mean imagine uh, right now people that are creating therapies and treatments for COVID uh, someone comes out with the gene therapy that, you know, it, it treats COVID and eliminates it, but then also your genes become so strong that you cannot get any of the previous infectious diseases that exist for mankind. I, most people are going to take this and they also might do so without uh, putting the proper years of research behind them just in order to be, okay, like we're all safe. And you know, the collective God complex of, of human beings when you, when you feel like you can't get sick, uh, definitely in our book changes, changes society uh, a whole bunch. Um, yeah. And another quick thing is, is Bruce, uh, that coming back to the scales, Bruce kind of throughout all of his notes, which you see as a reader, he relates himself to a T-cell and the journey of a T-cell take. So you get to kind of, uh, you know, like see behind the scenes of Bruce's notebook as he starts to uh, discover or as he, he you know, becomes... Um, I don't know. Yeah, as he discovers this new gene therapy. Yeah. And so um, uh, these science pages are, are peppered throughout the book, and uh, you know our, our attempt to uh, actually use conventional science, in this case, uh, how the immune system works, and make one little science fictional uh, leap um, to make it work a little bit differently. And uh, uh, lo and behold, we have this uh, entirely new uh, approach to immune health that we see in this uh, in this in this story. Um, and so this is uh, kind of an example of how we're uh, trying to encourage the, the more advanced readers um, to dig into a little bit of the science behind uh, Sumeria as they as they go along. Yeah, and and you know you know the book is is such that you can skim past all of the the super hard science if you want, or you can dig deeper if you'd like. Um, but you know Bruce was a really uh, a struggling artist on the inside. He was he he came up with uh, this gene therapy and saw what it did to society with, you know, the side effects. There was, you know, types of schizophrenia that were happening. Um, when, when they did eventually make a vaccine, it was limited. And the, you can see on the right, these, these are some of, our, uh, some of our artwork for when people just like going crazy to try to get this vaccine just so they can get that sense of confidence back and you know, all of the different security measures that were taken, which obviously people can relate to if you watch the news for a single day um, today. Um, but yeah, so Bruce, Bruce really had an internal struggle with whether what he did was right. And I think I can imagine that happening if somebody comes out with a vaccine today that has, uh, that has some side effects uh, it's, yeah. for, for anything. It's, it's probably a, a, a psychological torment. Um, yeah. But along with, with Bruce, you have the the company that funded this, um, and that was led by uh, Damon Locke, who is was the CEO of the Naima Corporation. And this has a, a another very kind of you know hitting home theme because Damon Locke uh, took these monopoli monopolistic um, enterprises like Amazon and Facebook and Google and all of these. He took it to a completely new level. Uh, he was the CEO of a pharmaceutical company, and that company took in an Ancestry.com, 23andMe type of company, so they had access to all the genetic data that they could handle, and from that, they created a social network that was, well, basically even more than that, it was a, so a social, social experience platform that also monitors your health, it secures all of your information based on your genetic code, so nobody else can copy that, um, and they had a, a, a chip and called the seek chip that would go inside of you, uh, you know, so to keep you safe from things like pandemics, to keep you safe from pretty much all of the things that are, that, you know, are used in fear driven type of initiatives uh, in order to get everyone to sign up for this, for this network. So uh, it, it takes the surveillance and it takes the, um, you know, all of the genetic kind of questions that we have when we're giving our data to a 23andMe and it, it ramps it up to you know ten years in the future, 
Um, and basically everyone has subsided. Everybody said, you know, same way they do with cell phones. I know they're watching me, but I kind of need my cell phone. So, you know, you just, people will do it if they think it's going to keep them, their family members alive. And then from there, uh, you know, not so great things can happen. So we hope that it's uh, at least a tale of caution so people can keep their eye on, on things, you know, not, yeah. not going so far down the conspiracy theory rabbit hole, but just understanding what is happening as new technologies are introduced and what types of things you're giving up. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the background uh, to the Seek Network, um, you know, Tigris, uh, this story, we, we wrote this uh, several years ago. And uh, so a lot of this was really looking into the future about these really powerful technologies and in genetics, uh, in computation, uh, and, you know, artificial intelligence. And, uh, you know, fast forward to today, we're starting to see these types of things actually uh, show face in, in the news. Now, in Sumeria, we obviously take it in a much more dramatic format, uh, but these, um, uh, these topics uh, about technology, not necessarily uniting us, but perhaps even dividing us, um, that's really a, a central point that we wanted to bring to the audience about these really cutting edge uh, uh, tools that are out there so that there can be more public dialogue about how we, we all want to shape, uh, you know, the future of, of genetics or, um, you know, uh, um, you know, artificial intelligence and, and um, you know, and social uh, media platforms. So um, as, as uh, Jay mentioned, Demon, we have, you know, a typical, let's say, um, hero uh, versus uh, enemy uh, setup here. Um, and and uh, part of the hero side is um, another um, scientist, uh, uh, Dr. Jack Abbott, who's uh, Bruce's um, uh, brother by, by adoption. And uh, Jack has uh, a, a very uh, powerful set of skills in, in robotics and automation uh, that we start to learn about and uh, is really instrumental in, in discovering Tigris in the first place. But he um, is, you know, he, he actually suffers from uh, a disease where he, it's almost bubble boy syndrome. And so um, uh, he is forced to be uh, ultra hygienic. And, uh, and instead of cowering to this uh, disease, he finds strength and, and, and discovers new innovations in robotics in order for him to um, survive and, uh, uh, move, move forward. So, um, uh, he yeah. and Bruce, uh, you know, battle against, uh, Damon and, um, uh, we have a, uh, a setup for a, a really exciting thriller. Uh, ahead. Yeah, he, t he takes, he, we're, we're, we're running out of time a little bit, but he takes, uh, he takes the, the mask, the mask thing to a whole new level, figuring out nanotechnology to cover your whole entire body. So you don't have to worry about getting any diseases since he's never going to join the seek network. He's never going to, you know, fall to, the, the, the masses or fall to what, what the uh, higher ups want him to do. So he's not going to take this vaccine and he's not going to be on the Seek network. So um, our, this final kind of storyline is about Tessa Jones and she, she is, uh, you know, more uh, out there, you know, traveling and exploring space. And, and she basically has um, con first contact with an alien species that uh, in brief is, is a very, very uh, stark contrast. Their, their survival and their society is completely the opposite of uh, human beings. So that's something that we kind of keep going and people can sort of learn from different ways to live, which I think people are doing now that we're all stuck in our houses and we have to be you know, a little bit more kind of uh, intimate and, and family oriented. Yeah. But so, yeah. Uh, keep yeah, again, while, while, while this pandemic has been kind of raging on, uh, we do see major um, uh, endeavors in, in space through companies like SpaceX and, and uh, others, um, you know, that are really pushing the limits of, of space travel. And uh, this is the kind of orthogonal uh, storyline that we have where there's a turmoil chaos building on Earth, but uh, Tessa alone is uh, um, uh, really trying to find a potential new home. And uh, it's 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 a really interesting uh, it, story. It, this this one seemed way further out than than the other technologies, <laughs> but with with the last six months of people being on lockdown, it actually you hear more people like I would take a trip to Mars. Like I'm I'm out of here. This place is you know like we can't we can't yeah. do it. So it's 
uh, a lot of the a lot of the sci-fi is is starting to become reality, even in the psychology of human beings. So, um, yeah. yeah, I think we 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 might have to just run through these really quick. These are just yeah. things that we are doing uh, currently. Uh, Legend of Sumeria, book two. Bijou and I are working away on it, and it, this the first book was about kind of blood and physical of mankind, and that the physical relationships with uh, their environment. And this one is going to be about the mind. And we'll also get into some uh, really cool AI and some awesome battles between uh, different entities. So um, the next one is a, oh, this is a sine waves community um, youth mural that I did with a bunch of kids in Red Bank, New Jersey. Uh, and it's just a tribute to the form of, uh, of forces in our universe that pretty much allow our existence and allow for light and motion. So uh, uh, I don't know, I thought it was a, a, a very a nice thing to be able to get some kids involved and learn about science in a, in a, in a cool and creative way. So, yeah. and, um, uh, as, much, as much as I love creating uh, Samaria with Kay, I haven't uh, given up my day job. So uh, we're still hard at work in the lab. Uh, uh, developing new um, uh, genetically modified cell therapies. Um, so we take your own uh, cells, uh, you know, incorporate genetics into those cells in order to make them uh, a medicinal agent. And we've uh, been working on ways to implant those cells in the body to track, um, uh, you know, disease progress, the disease, um, uh, diseases and, and, and uh, you know, apply local treatments, uh, approaches to treat the body from outside um, using a, a cell-based device. And this is actually something that we're soon to start applying to COVID patients. Uh, and finally, uh, how to actually produce these types of medicines that are derived from our own cells and genes in really large commercial um, uh, you know, batches. Those are uh, three main thrusts in the lab right now. Um, and uh, uh, finally, Gary, you want to uh, kind of introduce this stuff? Uh... Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, uh, we, we did a, a few talks because uh, we just had some interest from uh, friends and fans that, uh, you know, based on mostly Bijou's, um, you know, scientific background and his work right now, uh, everyone is interested in what's going on with vaccines, what, what needs to happen, how long is it going to take, uh, what, what is life going to be like after the pandemic. And since our book kind of made some um, predictions, uh, maybe sci-fi type predictions, but a lot of them are starting to come true. So we uh, just sit down and talk for a little bit about um, about different themes and different uh, questions that people might have in what this world's going to look like after after COVID. And uh, that's going to start uh, next Monday. We're going to put it out each Monday. And then, you know, right now it's only a five-part discussion, but if it gets any traction, maybe we'll keep doing it. Fantastic. And uh, thanks again uh, to, uh, to uh, Julia and uh, the team at SciArt for, for inviting us here. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. And I'm glad you're doing this talk on future after COVID because now I'm, I'm curious <laughs> to get your <laughs> advice on that. But um, yeah, just hearing you talk about creating the story and it's funny how science fiction can really overlap really closely with reality and sometimes actually predict the future. What was it like creating this story um, focused on the virus and then having the COVID pandemic happen? Uh, yeah, uh, maybe I'll, I'll start with that, Jay. Um, you know, so uh, again, uh, the, the, the kind of original story, um, gosh, it's been uh, 10 years uh, since, uh, you know, we first kind of put oh, wow. together the, the concept and, and the driving force was you know, there's a lot of different uh, ways right now that, uh, you know, our society is being divided. And uh, one of them that I wanted to, you know, really, uh, I guess, uh, you know, embellish on is, uh, is healthcare. And so that, that's kind of where things started. Um, but, you know, I think the pandemic is only one uh, topic that we started to see actually manifest in reality. Uh, again, to much to Jay and my own dismay that it happened so much quicker um, that, you know, things like a pandemic or things like uh, large pharmaceutical companies merging with, uh, you know, genetic mining companies or, or um, you know, creating uh, large types of deals or, or even SpaceX and what's what's taking place in, right. uh, in outer space. These things uh, happening on such a rapid timescale, it, it, you know, it blew our, um, uh, it blew my mind to see that 
it was happening so quickly and it it really pushed us to get this story out um you know as soon as possible so that this wouldn't uh, no longer be history yeah there'll be some more futuristic uh, propositions uh, within it so jay you have anything what, to add to uh yeah what, what was surprising to me um was mostly the interconnectivity of all of these things so you know we we kind of imagined that um this this more secure social network would would arise from the fear of of health you know or the fear of the virus or the fear of of um biological warfare and and now that there is you know this covid that that is global and is you know obviously garnering a lot of appropriate attention there are all of these talks about ways to make ourselves more secure and you know oh like you can't it just it just like uh you know the contact tracing is a perfect example where that's a technology that i never really thought about it it like not not so quickly would people be uh afraid of something in order to just sign up for something like contact tracing or something as uh as extreme as we thought that that the seek network was um and i think that covid has sort of shown us that maybe our ideas weren't even as extreme as they could have been because I, right right now i think people might sign up for the seek network if they if if it could say like oh we're going to monitor through the seek chip we're going to monitor your your genes and then if you get covid you just know it instantly that you got it and then you just have to stay you know stay in your room or whatever um so that that's it was just really a, it's bizarre anyway uh, regardless of our book uh, the whole world is bizarre but uh, we, yeah we have kind of like an added layer of the onion of bizarreness yeah yeah that's really interesting about getting it published before it becomes actually just based on reality <laughs> yeah. um how did you two meet and uh like can you tell us about the origin of this collaboration uh yeah i'll start there uh so jay and i uh you know our best friends we we met at, at rutgers university actually as, as undergrad started over a beer <laughs> <laughs> yeah like all good startups and all good ideas um and so from there i think we we independently you know we're interested in writing uh we, we've taken a lot of um you know kind of uh adventures together um, outside of the us and uh and all the time we had our journals uh so it was probably inevitable that we'd start uh, kind of a, a joint venture writing together. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the opportunity came about when um, I was working on a little, um, uh, you know, storyline, uh, but clearly I don't have the chops of like really making an enriched, uh, deep um, science fiction thriller. And uh, Jay, um, you know, offered to give it a read and give send some notes. And he, he really, I think, was compelled by the, the concepts. And uh, when we started working together, um, this element of, of creativity really exploded and uh, instead of being a story that kind of connected the dots of characters it really you know had this worldview changing um, as well as the addition of a number of, of new storylines so uh, it, you know it, it, it couldn't have been a more fun project and we're uh, you know really excited to keep it going there's a, a second and third version that are behind the scenes that um, you know with support from your group and our uh, readers and fans uh, you know, we're, we're doing it for them. So. Yeah. And I, I, uh, I generally, uh, love to, to create things. And, um, this was sort of a no brainer just because Bijou and I would have, you know, long drawn out discussions about like different things that happen in the world. And I thought, you know, at least 20% of it was really good stuff that people would want to hear, you know? Um, <laughs> so I think well, why not put it in print and we, you know, make something out of, our discussions, you know, I guess we probably could have done a podcast and it would have been a lot easier when it take you three years. <laughs> so, uh, we like, we're we're that. overly ambitious. <laughs> yeah. Had, um, had either of you collaborated across disciplines like this? Like for Jay, had you collaborated with scientists before or Bijou with an artist? No, nothing other than, um, having you know on a film you would sometimes need a an expert to come in to just like look over a script and that's a few hours of a of a, of a meeting really but um my my science um interest and my enthusiasm around science has kind of just been a personal journey but as far as uh working on something for real with anyone bg's the only uh 
only scientist that I've ever worked with, and I'm sure that our uh, our kind of similar spirit and adventures and like you know we we like to have fun um, made it a lot easier. I don't know if if I just picked a scientist out of a hat if I would if they if they would like me or be able to to uh, to you know to handle handle me or um, you know whatever that word is to if I'm palatable to scientists or vice versa, but I think, you know, finding a, a, the right partner in any endeavor is a, is a huge thing. So but we were, we were lucky to have already an awesome report. Yeah. It, it, it sounds like we're almost talking about getting married and stuff <laughs> when we first found each other and have we been with anybody else, but no, I, I, I've always had admiration for, for art. You're um, in this forever. issue. <laughs> in fact, I think, um, you know, one 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 general note is just that uh, how much science fiction has actually driven real science. Um, I think it's you know something that gets underappreciated, and, and we're trying to uh, bring more uh, science fiction uh, you know creators out there because um, you know it's only with that merger that really new um, you know major uh, you know transformative changes could occur because someone simply just has an innocent idea um, and. Uh, without knowing that with some effort and, and um, you know, a lot of team coming around, that one day could be a reality. So um, I, I, I think that was something that I didn't expect when working with, um, with Jay, is that there were actually ideas that came about through our conversations that literally went back to the lab uh, to actually, uh, you know, evaluate if this was possible. Uh, and that, oh, wow. that um, uh, still goes on today. So it's been, uh, you know, a really great synergistic um, uh, work uh, and team that independently has had um, you know impact on my own professional life um, you know in, in, in academic research uh, lab. Wow can you can you just briefly if you can think of one of one example of a, a time that happened? Uh, yeah well uh, you know I think when it comes to the uh, uh, seek um, network itself uh, just to give a moment to describe this so imagine you know, Facebook and all of these social um, media, uh, you know, platforms like LinkedIn and Twitter, uh, imagine them all being driven in large part by a unique identifier, which is an individual's genetics. So now genetics is tied in along with people's, you know, likes and preferences. Uh, but that aspect of personalized, um, you know, let's say uh, genetic background gets factored in when, when people are evaluating you know, job prospects, uh, you know, your genome directs you towards these types of job preferences or, you know, relationships and, and uh, you know, dating preferences. There's, there's uh, aspects of the SEEK network that um, dictates that, uh, as well as ultimately healthcare. So uh, I think, you know, for, uh, for a project that emerged, um, what I began to realize is that even though we have a, a sense of the human genome, uh, there's still a lot of things that are unknown and even further, if we look at other organisms out in the world, we know even less about the genomes, for example, of bats or, you know, um, uh, animals or, or, you know, things that are, nowadays are even more important to understand uh, to stop the spread of, of viral, you know, contamination and diseases. So uh, what, what came about through conversation with Jay is, wow, we, we don't have a tool to really rapidly take a genetic sequence and understand functionally what those proteins mean, uh, at least in a, in a really rapid, cheap way. And so that led to a new technology that we've been working on in the lab that's called okay. LASSO probes. Um, I'll spare you the acronym, science has way too many of them. But uh, these probes are meant to uh, capture regions of the genome in a single shot uh, and, and basically express them to rapidly study what those gene encoded regions uh, actually functionally make. So we can make uh, more rapid advances in, in understanding uh, proteins and understanding genomes more uh, broadly than even just our, our human cells. Wow, that's very cool. Um, and, and for, uh, yeah, go, oh, go ahead. ahead. I was going to just say, for for me, I have a uh, my, our our relationship that you know will continue on until one of us perishes. Um, <laughs> I, I have a a, a very ambitious life goal of to tr try to get people that 
um, are on one side of the science and spirituality argument, you know, closer to the center. Um, I just, it really angers me that people are, you know, dying over something that is more or less a miscommunication um, when they've just been taught that one thing, to, when you look at a star, that's science, and when you look at a star, that's God. And they can be both, both the same things. And I think that there is a scientific explanation for everything, but that doesn't mean that those explanations couldn't be created by a divine thing and everybody can't live in some sort of, of harmony, even with different, um, even with different beliefs on, on, these, on these issues. Uh, so for me, in, in order to ever take steps towards actualizing that goal, I definitely need like a, a true scientist at my back to be able to like help me sort of get these uh, ideas into some type of a way that the science community would be like, all right, maybe this is okay. Um, you know, so it's, it's made me start uh, studying epigenetics and how you can have impacts on your offspring and offspring and offspring and generations down the line, which to me could be something like spirits or ghosts that are, are inside of you. And again, that these are just different words, um, but epigenetics I think might be a, uh, a key to trying to bring science and spirituality a little bit closer together. Wow. Well, we do have some questions in from the audience, so I'll let Julia give us some of those. Cool. Hey, Thanks, Carrie. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your work. I want to remind everyone or, or tell everyone that um, if they have piqued your interest, Legend of Sumeria is available on Amazon. You should definitely get a copy because the next one's going to be coming out soon enough. But, but get it from legendofsumeria.com instead just so we don't have to give Amazon more money. <laughs> there you go. That's even better. Um, not just I mean, we as in the whole entire world, not we as in me. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Amazon's doing okay. You can go to straight to legendofsumeria.com. Um, so uh, we have a couple of questions here. The first one, have you ever thought of converting some of these images in the book to anaglyph images, which if you don't know what those are, they're stereoscopic images. So two images overlaid, um, like you wear the glasses for. Gotcha. Uh, I'll, well, I'll have to defer to Jay on that one. <laughs> yeah, well, so, so we actually um, put this book, and it is still in the process, we've actually uh, put it into a 3D virtual uh, platform that BJ and I helped kind of develop. Um, it's, it's become a, quite a big undertaking, and we, are, we both have uh, a lot of things on our, our, our artistic and scientific plate. But basically, what that software does is it takes the different layers of, of you know, the foreground and the background, and as you move a tablet, it'll you know, slide things back and forth, so it gives you this kind of like a little bit more um, you know, immersive type of experience. Uh, so, so, so not specifically that technology, but we definitely have already been um, messing around with, uh, with kind of adding some depth to, to our artwork, uh, which, which has been a lot of fun. It has been definitely you know, a challenge, as, as I've said, just because also the book is, is pretty, it's a pretty long book. So um, any of these types of kind of conversions to new technologies is, is a, a bit of a massive undertaking. Um, but also just on the on the different types of media, this the second book that we are in the process of writing, uh, we're actually going to take that uh, to a few people in the film and TV world just to kind of like feel out whether it might work as a series or something. So uh, you know, especially with all the you know possible new interests uh, on the sciences in the post pandemic future. So very cool. That's amazing. Um, next question is. Uh, I was wondering what you would say to the statement, science needs to be explained and art experienced. How, if you did, did you balance these general expectations of your respective fields in your process of collaboration and in the final output? It's mm -hmm. a good one. Uh, I'll, I'll just say quickly, um, we, we like to sort of break the rules and, and just say, I, I don't, 
fully agree that you can't have something that is is science and art. Um, you know, for instance, in the the sine waves piece, like I feel like this the the form of sign is innately um, artistic, but then it also has an explanation behind it that it you know is the way that light travels. So, um, so I I do think that sometimes they're hard to find these intersections between science and art where it all you know works together. Um, but as far as the product goes, we we did our best to um, have the art and the story be at the forefront. Um, and then the science kind of just be in the background and you can go to look at the science on these kind of notebook pages and things like that to try to keep it as a human story. Um, you know, because science sometimes we, we understand can be a little bit dense or confusing for people. So we, we're, we're doing our best to, to make it palatable for, for everyone. Um, and even, uh, you know, as beautiful as possible. So even people that aren't interested in the science, you know, at all could still enjoy the artistic value and, and kind of ha get some emotional um, value out of it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think there, there, we try to emphasize the experiences that, that science impacts. Uh, so without uh, having all the explanations in the forefront, um, you know, it was more, this is the new scientific, um, you know, innovation. Uh, what does that do to the world? Uh, we, we wanted to make sure that was emphasized. Um, but, you know, we, we also touched upon uh, the lifestyle of scientists or, you know, astronauts or uh, some of the, um, you know, characters in our story and uh, also highlighted their experience, um, uh, you know, doing science. And, um, and, you know, oftentimes that can be uh, a lot of, uh, you know, isolation uh, and, you know, working on, on things that uh, may not manifest for, for several years. So uh, we, we try to also, uh, you know, get a, a glimpse of, you know, a scientist and their experience, especially when, you know, they, they do make a breakthrough. And, um, you know, I think that's kind of one thing that's the most, uh, uh, let's say, addicting aspect of, of conducting science experiments is that when you actually uh, discover something, I mean, 99 times out of 100, you're not, but when you actually get that one, um, you actually realize in that moment that you're the only person in the world that knows this information. And so it becomes uh, almost a responsibility to disseminate that uh, very um, appropriately. And, uh, you know, and also, you know, do no harm and, and try to uh, steer it in a, in a positive direction. And so we, we do um, highlight some of the experiences that scientists have uh, through this book uh, as you follow some of the characters uh, that are in the lab and have that aha moment and, uh, you know, how they, how they react. And, and uh, that also includes, you know, their interaction with, with loved ones and, you know, families, uh, scientists, um, you know, have uh, life outside of the lab. And so we wanted to, um, you know, show that as well. So, yeah, I think, I think that the science, to try to simplify it, is science what, uh, is what builds the world, and art is what happens when we move around and create inside of that world. I like that. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's definitely that kind of question. Whatever Bijou, whatever Bijou was just saying inspired that thought, so this is how it works. Like, he talks about <laughs> stuff. <laughs> uh, I can see why back. you guys work well together. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, this type of conversation, I mean, this is a conversation that I think, you know, evolves as science evolves and art evolves in new mediums and uh, the way that science is brought to the public through media like graphic novels, you know, this was not the case um, before recently. And, and so, so maybe this science needs to be explained, art experienced, uh, that, that probably won't be a saying for much longer, uh, at least in my opinion. But okay, we have one more minute for a very complicated question, but maybe you have a kind of gut reaction to it. Um, where is the boundary between cautionary stories versus contributing to stereotypes that feed public distrust of science? I'm thinking specifically of the pharmaceutical field, which obviously has monetary drives, but are also developing therapies that improve and save people's lives. Yeah, no, it's a great, uh, this is a great question. And I think, um, you know, after releasing Sumeria, uh, we've been approached by a, a lot of people in the bioethics community uh, that not only you know, are fascinated by the story, but also, you know, want to use science fiction as a tool to get uh, ethical stories out there in the public to, um, to create discourse. And I think that's 
Um, so, you know, the, the answer is it's not a clear black and white. Um, you know, in some respect, genetics is um, uh, really uh, opening up a lot of opportunities for us to know about the causes of disease, um, you know, identify targets, for example, for disease like cancer, and, uh, and approach medicine with a lot more precision. So that's obviously a, you know, a, a great quality. Uh, on the other side, you know, is, is a potential risk for, uh, you know, genetic information to really, without, uh, you know, the right boundaries to, um, you know, navigate into areas that otherwise we would not want it to. For example, you know, linking that to buying choices and, and it becoming a driver of advertising or, um, you know, helping to uh, solve um, crimes, but without necessarily consenting to releasing that genetic information, um, you know, for, you know, for, for the solving of crimes through forensic science. There was a, a very fascinating case um, about the, uh, a serial killer in, in, in San Francisco that was apprehended because, um, you know, his, his genetic sequence or actually a family members was found on one of these databases. And without really any kind of, um, uh, you know, discussion, the police, uh, you know, made that forensic link and uh, arrested the, the individual. And so in all cases, I want serial killers removed off the street, but, uh, but that um, use of genetics in that context was never really brought to any discussion uh, by the public. And I think that's, uh, again, been our goal. We, we don't really have the answers to a great question like that, but we hope that um, together we could discuss it and identify um, you know, these different scenarios before they happen so that when they happen, it's not just people in power that get to make that call without, um, you know, consensus uh, coming from the public itself. So. And, and I, I would say just really quickly is that, you know, I, I personally have my issues with capitalism as it stands, especially its relationship with healthcare. Um, so if I understand the question uh, correctly, uh, we certainly would never want to e expose an evil idea to someone for them to, for them to, you know, create. If, if nobody ever thought of these things and we gave them that idea, that would certainly weigh heavy. Uh, but but what we are doing as we're creating these things is we see the writings on the wall. Like there are these, there, we're already on trends to to be at the Seek Network. We're already on trends to have vaccines that people just need to be wary of. So um, I think it's hopefully exposing what what those higher level um, potential uh, companies and things like that have in the long term plans, and to try to expose it to the public beforehand so we can have these ethical conversations uh, prior to anything bad happening. Well, I, uh, I think that's a wonderful note to end on. And uh, I just wanted to thank you both again for joining us and sharing your work and talking about future collaborations. That's definitely something we'll have to check back in with you about. Um, so keep me in the loop. Uh, for everyone who attended, thanks so much for tuning in. This lunch break series will continue on a monthly basis. So just be sure you sign up for our newsletter on our website, uh, sireinitiative.org, if you haven't already. You can also follow us on Facebook and Eventbrite. And in case you're interested, next week, Wednesday evening in Eastern Standard Time, we will be having a networking mixer, which is a new virtual event we're hosting um, while we still are uh, not doing physical events. So if you're interested in this networking mixer, just check out our Facebook or Eventbrite page and RCP. Um, so Jay and Bijou, thanks again. And uh, looking forward to seeing what you guys get up to next. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank thanks you. everyone for whoever's, whoever's yeah. listening. And um, yep, feel free to uh, you know follow us on at Legend of Sumeria on Instagram and Twitter. and. Uh, our website, we're going to be posting those uh, post-pandemic discussions uh, starting next Monday. So uh, if you want to hear what two uh, crazy guys think is going to happen in the future, then <laughs> tune in. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> right. Bye. Bye.